termómetro global por la recuperación de los mundiales de la empresa Tampoco son muy Global Just Recovery Gathering. Bulevnaka, and welcome to our Global Just Recovery Gathering panel on hearing the guardians of the earth. I am Fintan Butunakambua, and I have the absolute privilege to be in conversation with these three incredible human beings. Ariel Durange is an indigenous activist from the Athabasca Chippewan First Nation. Francisco Manzaneres is an 11 year old Colombian climate and environmental activist. And Nolene Nambulipo is an activist and advocate for disenfranchised women and peoples in the Pacific. Francisco, Ariel, and Nolene, it is such an honor to be in conversation with each of you. Thank you so much for being willing to do this. I wanted to chat a little bit with you today uh, because guardianship or stewardship over the sacred places we call home have become so much of what each of you do. And right now, especially, our people, our communities, and the places we are called to protect are struggling. People like yourselves are out there doing the work of resistance, reshaping realities, reimagining resistance, and also doing the work of reconciliation to live through both this climate crisis and this health crisis. People are tired and people are also tough. Folks are doing their best to stay grounded in the, in the audacity of hope and the level groundedness of heart. So I want to begin by again, thanking all three of you for being here. I want to honor and acknowledge the sacred spaces we are all joining in from and the many ways, shapes and forms you're present with us today. I am hoping we can meet each of you where you are and get a sense of the grounding behind how you move through this world. Masicho, uh, thank you. So, Iklanete, Dene Sotlaneta, Ariel the Ekwe Hushe, Duranje Betzini Hasli. I just introduced myself in my indigenous language, which is Dene or Dene Sotlane. Um, and I come from the Treaty 8 territory in Northern Alberta, in so called Canada. And I think that's a really important question is how relationship with the land drives the work that I do personally. And I can speak to my story. Um, even just the introduction of myself in my language and recognizing the names of our places is really important. Um, the name Athabasca Chippewan First Nation, which is the name that the colonial governments and structures gave our territories and our people during colonization isn't actually our name. And my nation's in the process of reclaiming that. And our true name is Kaithale Dene Sotlane. And it means people of the willow, people of the land. And it's a reference to the actual landscapes where our people originated from, which is the Peace Athabasca Delta. And the deltas are a mix of marshlands and forests, boreal forests, and the last uh, inland um, freshwater delta in the world the largest inland freshwater delta in the world. And so this is a beautiful landscape with so much biodiversity that it's been recognized as a UNESCO World Heritage Site in the Wood Buffalo National Park. And it is robust with so many different plants, so many different songbirds and migratory birds, including the last a migratory whooping crane on the planet, the last remaining mig migrating whooping cranes on the planet, and a million other beautiful birds and songbirds, as well as a unique, genetically unique herd of bison, free roaming bison, moose, caribou, which are in a species at risk, uh, beavers, muskrats, you know, wolves, lynx, these beautiful creatures. And when we the reason this is so important is that 
who we are as Dene people. When we say people of the willow, we are the people of the willow, but the willow is also home. And the Delta is also home to so much more. And there's a common phrase in a lot of indigenous nations throughout North America or Turtle Island that say, uh, all my relations. We often end a lot of our prayers with all my relations. And that is to give reverence and respect to the fact that everything is a part of our relation. And I think about growing up and the way that I was raised. I was raised to understand that I was related to the wolf and the bison and the caribou and the muskrat and the lynx. I was related to the rivers and the forests and the sand dunes that are part of our, our landscapes. We were related to all of the medicines. And in fact, we are often given medicine names. And I have this really great story that I wanna share because I just, I find it so powerful and beautiful that when you revere and see the world as your relation, as opposed to something to dominate, to own, to control, to develop your resources, you develop an intimate relationship that actually results in language. And I was given a medicine name for a pe peppermint, which is a plant that grows in the Athabasca Delta. And I remember I was about five years old and I really wanted to go pick these, these mint leaves. And I went down to the little marsh area because I knew that's where they grew. And I was looking and looking and looking and I couldn't find any. And then I went back and I was like looking at the plant. I was like, what does it look like? My mom's like, it looks like this. And I was just like, I can't find any. She's like, it's there. And I was like, I went back out and I looked. And I was like, I can't find any at all. And she stopped and she said, did you talk to the plants? Did you talk to the peppermint? And I said, no. And she's like, did you make it an offering? And I said, no. And she gives me a little bit of tobacco in my hand. She goes, take it, go talk to the peppermint and give it an offering. And she's like, and you'll find it, I promise. And I went back out to the land and I sat down on the shore where I had looked a million times and I just closed my eyes and I started speaking to the peppermint plant. I said, I'm here, I honor you, I respect you. And I give my little offering, I pray, I say all my relations at the end. And I, lo and behold, I opened my eyes and I, had, I was sitting the entire time in a patch of peppermint. I just couldn't see it because I wasn't speaking to it. And this is a description of the ways in which relationships with the natural world don't just, aren't just some mythical, magical thing. They are tangible and they are real. They allow us to see the living world in a completely different way that when you are disconnected from those places, it, you see them as something that's not a part of you. You see them potentially as an object, as something to control or own or dominate, which came with colonization, this dominance, this desire, man's dominion over nature. And that was such a foreign concept to our people and our families. And people don't understand that uh, colonization isn't something that happened a long time ago. The treaty in my territory was signed in 1899. And my, my grandfather, not my great distant someone I didn't know, but my grandfather who I knew and grew up with, who didn't speak a lick of English, <laughs> only spoke Dene. So my grandfather was a child when treaties were signed in my territory, which is an important context to understand that these aren't distant memories. These are lived experiences of our people. We are still in a process of colonization, which is trying to further remove us from these landscapes that fed us, that clothed us, that gave us medicines, that taught us the languages of the lands and the river systems and the air and the ecosystems all around us. We have clan systems that are named after the animals in our territories. And it's really intrinsically important for our people to protect these things because they're the languages that our colonizers and settler folks don't understand. They don't hear the words of the peppermint. They don't hear the words of the caribou. And in my territory, we are inundated with the expansion of the Alberta oil sands, which is the largest industrial project on earth to dig up bottom of the barrel fossil fuels that is threatening all of those beautiful landscapes. These places that nurtured my grandparents, my parents, my great grandparents, and so on and so forth for millennia. And my chief once said, 
If they destroy the Delta, then who are we? Who are we if there is no more Athabasca Delta? Who, who are we if there's no more Kaitale Done Sotune? And it's really important that our where we come from is intrinsically, intrinsically a part of our identities to the core and that we carry intergenerational and blood memory of those relationships, those languages, those songs, and the memories of the land. And we continue to enact our responsibilities to speak for those that cannot speak. I love that. Um, hello, everyone. And really, it's a wonderful um, session to be part of. Um, so I'd say from who I am and from where I come, um, my father's people's from Drabwalu Nadeva in Kandavu. Um, and that's the southernmost um, island group um, of the Fiji um, area of, um, of islands, but also my mother's from settler colonialist people of Australia and Europe. So I think I've um, imbibed and, and been part of both the struggles um, for decolonization myself um, in, in this body, but also um, growing up both in uh, Fiji for particularly, you know, from birth to about 16, 17, and then um, being taken to Australia and uh, trying to find, you know, what is my place in, in that place? Um, and what is my relationality to the indigenous peoples there, to migrants there, um, experiencing, you know, that kind of dislocation myself and, and then coming home. Um, and then rediscovering home at a, at a different time in your life. You know, the other thing about this beautiful thing is that, um, I don't know, I think I'm both part of the cacophony um, that we create, but also the music, you know, of Earth System. So, and we're making them, we're making this music as we go. So um, for me, I think it, it came from kind of an early understanding that there were so many who were experiencing injustice and that I was disquieted first and then curious and trying to find out, you know, what's my place in um, working on issues of, of justice and equality and liberation. And, you know, we hear a lot of these words, but um, as humans, we're trying to make sense of them all the time. Um, so part of that work, I think for me now at 53 years old, um, is that I'm trying to do both, you know, the, the, the work that we have to do in community um, because of where we are right now, um, but also that there's a specific need that I'm trying to fill for myself and with my collective and, and communities for rest and quiet and well-being work. Um, and that's for not just because we need it for our bodies, but also so that we can listen a bit better and more deeply and really discern more what's necessary in our work um, because this repairing of the ecosphere um, and this you know wonderful support for uh, for us and other species of this incredible planet um, we're breaking that and we need to kind of quieten the noise and let you know to me to me this idea about guardians yes it's us but much more it's the bees um, and it's the frogs and it's the insects and it's the microbes and really antibiotics, you know, and it's about all of these things that are under threat. They're telling us really clearly and strongly um, that, that we're killing so many systems. The bees are abandoning the hives. So they're speaking clearly, birds are dropping from the skies, you know, whales are beaching themselves. And for many reasons, there's noise, there's pollution, um, and these, you know, incredible boats that we send out, um, ships that we send out around the ocean and really breaking those those lines of passage um, that we've all had on the planet so so those things children are also showing us very clearly you know the effects on their bodies on their energies and and so we keep trying to silence those voices the guardians with drugs we do it with medication we build alternate systems you know we we as humans um, many humans are we're trying to kind of um, fix around the problem, um, but still they speak and then they just keep speaking louder and they're notifying us of a, a system change, but not the one we, we, we want. Eh? And the other last point I just wanted to make was that, you know, women and gender non-binary people, you know, and black and brown and South bodies, they're telling us that we're exhausted from servicing things like 
you know, false systems like patriarchy and neoliberal capitalism. And, and so when we have these societies that ignore this and, you know, close our ears to things like this, this massive amount of unpaid care, domestic and communal work um, of women and how it sits on our bodies, um, we, we have to do this breaking and building. We have to decide what it is we leave behind again um, and what we take forward um, and, and how we retain strength for this change work. Um, because these systems are deep and long, um, the unjust systems, are just as much as the wonderful, um, beautiful life-based systems from which we come. So I, I think I talk a lot about breaking and building these days, um, personally, organizationally, but also in, in South feminist movements, we're hearing it a lot more because people are trying to make sense of this multiple forms of work, you know, and some of them see us doing the kind of breaking work, but maybe they're not seeing all of the, you know, propository, uh, I don't even think that's a word, but the proposals um, that we're putting forward and saying there are alternatives that we can, um, that we've always had, that we can draw from and that we can reconfigure. Um, so we're trying to recover from patriarchy, from imperialism, from coloniality and colonialism, from extractivism, from, from war and cruelty, even here in the Pacific, you know, look at the damage we've done through nuclear power and um, nuclear weapons and um, man patriarchy is just manifested in so many kinds. So we have to recuperate our relationships to each other and to the earth. I think just for now, I'll stay in that. Mm -hmm. Lo que debe ser la prioridad para la humanidad en estos siglos y en estos momentos, en esta situación de crisis climática, de crisis medioambiental y de crisis por la pérdida de biodiversidad que estamos viviendo. Es decir, que el ambiente debe ser algo en lo que nos debemos enfocar, como niños, como ciudadanos, y principalmente por ello, pero también algo que me inspiró y que me motivó a hacer lo que hoy yo hago y a hacer eh, la vida que hoy llevo, eh, pues en sí creo que también fue vivir y crecer desde los dos años en un entorno hermoso, en un territorio hermoso, rodeado de quebradas, rodeado de montañas, rodeado de pájaros, rodeado también de patos, chivos, de gallinas, como no. Y yo creo que el estar en ese entorno es algo que a ti te inspira, que te, a ti te engancha, te enamora a, a, a eso, en ese territorio, ¿sí? Porque si hubiera vivido en una ciudad común y corriente, con contaminación visual, con contaminación auditiva, como lo de la capital de Colombia, Bogotá, pues si hubiera sido diferente. Yo nací en Bogotá, pero vivo en Villeta, que es un... Colombia en general es un territorio hermoso porque somos el segundo país más biodiverso del mundo. Y eso ha sido o a tomar la vida que llevo. Thank you so much, Francisco. Much appreciated. Now, you know, just in the in the context of everything that we've heard about, like Francisco was just talking about how important it is in order for us to know who we are, we need to know where we come from and and the lands to which we belong. Um, also, uh, Ariel, you you talked about how. We need to be in conversation with the natural world to not be extractive. You know, Lean, you spoke about so many things, including um, this, this idea of listening differently. This, uh, you shared truths around how self bodies are exhausted and how the work really is right now the breaking and the building, right? The this and the that, the both and the and. And in the context of recovering, from the climate crisis and the health crisis, what does that look like for you? You know, it seems to me, I mean, just to, to talk a little about this, it seems to me that what we're recovering from um, is clear, you know, that there's a lot that we have to kind of um, recover from, but also recuperate and, and reinvigorate. Um, and one of the quick things that I just wanted to say um, is that 
you know, for, for many of us women from the economic South, particularly in indigenous women and, and um, migrant women and many others who've really experienced, you know, a lot of the, the pain and conflict and marginalization from patriarchy and capitalism and, you know, heteronormativity. Um, one of the things is not just going back to practices that actually might also have patriarchy in their core. Right? So for me, it's about in our, you know, we have these stories in our um, narratives about women being buried under sacred houses when their male partners died. Okay, I'm not going back to that future. Um, carrying a past, you know, where people were taken as slaves by other communities or an old kind of patriarchal warrior culture. So so that, that ability to do that breaking and building of our own stories itself, you know, of where we come from and what we want to take forward is really, really important. Um, and it's an empowering set of work, um, but it can get caught and captured in our kind of noise that we have today. So one of the things I think that um, some of us as South feminists are trying to do is to say, this work that we're doing right now uh, about liberation on all territories is about this, about material and structural change, because it's actually the same work. It's different parts of that work. Um, but I think that we have to talk about these bodies in which we carry everything, you know, ourselves and our people and the ancestors and where we come from and where we're going. You know, I have a three-year-old daughter, so I I've been thinking a lot about summoning her from 30 years from now, you know, and, and, and her saying to me, you know, what is this work you've been doing? And I think that we have to protect our bodies with sexual reproductive health and right, for instance. We have to know about sexuality. We have have to have the essentials of food and water and shelter and sanitation, you know, those things that really have a material value. And we talk about them like ab abstracts, you know, what kind of society do we want to be in? What do we call, what really, if you, if you open up a word that we use a lot like social protection, what does that look like to protect each other? You know, we, Martin Luther King and others have talked about beloved community. What does that look like when it's made manifest? Because there's a lot of bodies that, you know, suffer indignities and violence. And, you know, here we have two and three women in the Pacific who experience gender-based violence. So what does that look like to be liberated from that? How do we share power and knowledge and, 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 um, and a society and a world in much more just um, ways. What about people with disabilities? Um, in Fiji, we have um, you know, so many more NCDs, non-communicable diseases. And I think about the fact that we don't even show people with, um, who've lost limbs in our data systems. We, we don't even show LGBTQI people in our, you know, in our statistics. So we have to think all of these systems like states that we've created, they're artificial and we're now living as if they've always been there and, you know, and that they serve everybody, but they really don't. So we have to think what comes next. What does something beautiful and different and just look like? Um, so that's what I want to do. A recovery for me is from all of that not just from, you know, COVID-19, which is just the latest manifestation of many other things prior. Yeah. <laughs> importante la recuperación justa y recuperarnos eh, equitativamente porque pues crisis no solo sanitaria con la de COVID-19 sino también con la crisis climática nos ha dejado muy mal en términos de desigualdad, en términos de inmigrantes también, en términos de que muchas personas han tenido que dejar sus casas y han tenido que vivir muchas cosas, ¿no? que pues a nadie se les desea, ¿no? Eh, por supuesto. Y en sí, yo creo que esto es importante porque la, y porque la recuperación justa no, no solo es transversal al ambiente, a lo social, a las desigualdades, a las causas de género, a los conocimientos indígenas, como ya lo nombraba mi compañera panelista, sino que también es transversal a muchas cosas más, a la política, necesitamos una recuperación justa en la política, en la participación política de los jóvenes y de los niños, a la ciudadanía, a, a los espacios sociales, eh, a la economía también, ¿no? Y en sí también, por supuesto, eh, una recuperación justa, y yo diría que también una muy importante, con el ambiente porque durante, durante la pandemia muchos dijeron que en realidad el ambiente mejoró, pero 
relativamente mejoró, entre comillas, porque desde nuestras casas contaminamos y contaminamos con toneladas y toneladas de plástico de un solo uso. Entonces, por ello, eh, creo que pues en sí debemos tener una recuperación justa transversal. Por ello es importante, porque la recuperación justa no se basa en un solo tema, se basa en muchos temas que, como ya los decían antes, son sumamente importantes cada uno, son claves y encajan. Si no está uno, pues digamos que el rompecabezas se, se, se desarma, ¿sí? Si no hay un punto pues el rompecabezas se desarma. Entonces, por eso es importante la recuperación justa. I think that's really, um, you made some really, really important points around a lot of times, particularly when we speak of indigenous peoples and relationships to land and, you know, restoring indigenous self-governance and all of these beautiful things that we get stuck in this idea that we're returning to something of like, you know, 500 years ago, and that that indigenous peoples have just become static, that they were they, they, they were that and they want to just return to that as if we have not lived through the last, you know, 500 plus years of colonization. But the reality is, is that colonization had lots of implications on our people. And there were just like peoples of the world and species of the world, evolution is a natural component Of, of life on this planet and our cultures are not static and we evolve and we change over time and it's really critical to understand that we're not we're not um, advocating for the return of something that was but we are advocating for the implementation and the respect and the reverence of the value systems that existed for millennia prior to the imposition of colonization, which led to this great imbalance. Um, through the work that I've done through Indigenous Climate Action and the organization that I helped found, we have been speaking with communities around climate change. And of course, recovery is a part of this. And one of the most tan tangible things that has come from almost any community, whether it's a Northern community, Southern community, a Cree, a Dene, Lakota, whatever community, when we get down to the bare bones of like, what is climate change? Like, what does it mean to our communities? The common thread is that they say, we are out of balance. We are out of balance with each other. We are out of balance with our relationships with the land. We are out of balance spiritually, mentally, physically, and emotionally. And when we are out of balance, uh, there is a response from, from mother earth, from the planet. And, climate change, the pandemics are a result of this imbalance that we have, uh, that we have entered into. And this imbalance, like the other really tangible, beautiful thing that has come out of all of these community engagements is that they have said that when you ask them, when did climate change start for you? You get these elders and they'll sit there for a long time and they'll think and they'll go, well, climate change started for us when the white man came. It started on colonization. The climate of our culture changed. That imbalance began at the set of colonization. Colonization caused climate change. Colonization of the lands, colonizations of our minds, colonizations of our value systems, of our governance, of our economies, of our gender systems, of all of those things, our religions, our spirituality. And when we are talking about recovery, recovery from COVID, a recovery from climate crisis, the climate crisis requires a rebalance, a rebalance of masculine, feminine, non-binary, a, a rebalance of our relationships with the natural world. That is the critical component. But in the Western ideologies and structures, we get stuck on like data sets that don't include the diversity of not just humans, but the diversity of species. And They are stuck within these sort of walls of Eurocentric Western scientific data collection and the solutions get stuck within those structures as well. And they're confined. So we search for solutions within the structure that, are, that created the challenges that we are faced in. Uh, and indigenous cosmologies, value systems, governance, um, ideologies, all of those things 
tend to be outside of that scope and have been demonized and devalued and pushed out of those systems. And we are advocating for those to be included <laughs> and utilized as foundational systems to be put forward to look at how there was harmonization prior to colonization and how those cultures have evolved and changed over time. Because I don't wanna go back to some of those patriarchal like value systems, but I do want to have those tenets of those values of relationship, of all my relations, of kaitale dene sotlene, what it means to be in relationship with the land and all of our relations. And those are the value systems that when we talk about, what are we recovering from? What are we recovering to? A future that isn't confined to Western Eurocentric ideologies and data collection, and one that imagines a future with everything and everyone in it. What are the words that you would offer up to your future selves to ground them in the world that you are visioning right now? One of the things that I, I really hope for ourselves is that we, what I'm trying to kind of, you know, talk about and think about a lot more now in all kinds of spaces is um, let, trying to think less about palatability, because I think a lot of us kind of, you know, we're very cautious about the way that, that we speak or we, um, or we provide input. And, and I think it's related to what Ariel talks about, you know, we are living in the current moment and the current moment is full of all kinds of dangers, including co-option, including, um, you know, these ideas like pluralism and assimilation and us trying to, we always talk as feminists about living in multiple realities, you know, that we're, we're both here, but we're beyond. And, and I really love that because it, it's another emancipatory thing, you know, it's a freeing kind of idea that, that I'm here, yes, and I'm working in a system um, that really is, 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 you know, sometimes filling me with fear. Um, it also is a time when though I feel a real revolutionary spirit, you know, that's, that's pushing us forward. Um, but that's because we've done so much damage. And um, I just sent out a tweet yesterday, you know, I was, I was looking at the Commission on the Status of Women, and I want to give this as, as an example, you know, here is a 26 year, and that's a tiny amount of time, but it's a substantive amount um, for us who've been working for the revolution, you know, and working for kind of um, justice for all, all bodies, including women and girls and, um, and ending violence. And, and I look at that and I think, you know why, you know, there's a, there's a philosopher right now who's been talking about how are, how are feminists doing this? How are we doing this revolution? Because you look at it only 120 years ago and here we are, um, you know, uh, uh, we have the vote and we're working through all kinds of issues and are we anywhere near where we need to be? No, but how incredible that that work goes on. And a lot of it is about this below ground and above ground work and the ability to work with other people who are really diverse from ourselves and to think through things like constituency and to talk about both tactics and strategy and then to place all of that within a basket of care, you know, within a basket of beloved community. And I, and I think there are many kinds of people around the world who are doing this, this beautiful set of work, building um, uh, something, something both old and new, you know, in the process of becoming. Um, and one of the things is, I, I think I'm going to be louder and more unapologetic this year. I've already started that way. Um, because, you know, time is short and the damage is really deep. And I'm thinking a lot about, you know, my daughter and my niece and others. And there's a local poet here, the Mari, who I love. You might know her, Fenton from La Toca. And she said she wants to be the most loving dragon there is because she's frightened sometimes that we're in such strong voice and we forget that we're also magic, you know, that we're also wonderful um, and loving and, and, and um, I think we have to do that care work for each other. Um, I'm going to rest a lot more, but I'm also going to work harder. So that's some of the things that I'm trying to do. And the last thing I want to say is I'm going to give nothing to patriarchy. I've decided, you know, for me, that means I'm not interested in protecting friends, peers, acquaintances, you know, um, so-called formal leaders who just you know, they're so heavily invested in these current systems and, and it's really hard for many of them to move. And I just, you know, in our community, there's a lot of us who kind of 
tiptoe around this and we're so polite, you know, this, I don't know, there's a word for it, civility politics, right? Um, and, and I think it's not about kind of, you know, us pointing fingers at others. It's about saying you are, you are responsible to every living part of this planet. And, and that means you are accountable to all of us, right? So if you get mad, be be mad because you're not doing what you need to do all of us need to do exactly what we can you know it's not for any of us to affirm or excuse others it's about saying we all have our work to change this and and um you know this living planet um it it requires us to be part of that to to be things that build life um and that help life to flourish and and not to close it down in so so many ways we find as humans to do so i think that's what i'm trying to do is think that way for for myself my daughter and my communities yeah <laughs> las acciones que yo hago que cada uno hace son muy importantes y son fundamentales dentro de un futuro básicamente Es decir, que lo que hacemos hoy nos va a afectar en el mañana. Eso hay que tenerlo claro y hay que tener mucho de eso en cuenta. Si todos colaboramos, cada uno aportando su granito de arena, como es esa frase tan famosa, <risa> cada uno con su activismo, con su pasión, con su ciudadanía, con con eso que hacen, con su profesión, eh, creo que vamos a tener un futuro donde todos podamos realmente, todos, no solo hablo de, de la especie humana, hablo todos en general, todos los seres vivos, los animales, los ecosistemas, donde podamos convivir en paz, donde podamos vivir en paz. Siempre se habla de la paz entre nosotros como humanos de la paz entre países y naciones, ¿cierto?, para evitar las grandes guerras, como ya lo vimos en un pasado. Pero más allá de eso, también debemos, eh, digamos, eh, tener paz con, con, con el ambiente y con los demás seres que también sufren eh, pues, por nuestro maltrato hacia ellos. Es un mensaje claro, yo creo que cada acción, como lo decía, es fundamental. Desde lo más pequeño hasta lo más grande. Todo tiene una consecuencia en sí. Y la consecuencia puede ser negativa o positiva. Y espero que las consecuencias de nuestras acciones sean positivas. Sean para andar y adaptar el cambio climático y el calentamiento global. Eh, para poder reducir esa tasa de migración. Para poder eh, basarnos en conocimientos ancestrales para poder también eh, tener una vida digna, darle una vida digna y a los ciudadanos, ¿no? Para todo esto, eso es fundamental, eso hace parte de lo que ya antes hablábamos como la recuperación justa. Entonces, vida digna, no se les olvide eso, eh, vida digna para todos. Entonces, pues así, el mensaje que les quiero dar hoy es de que, por supuesto, puedan seguir adelante con sus sueños, sus proyectos, con, con lo que hacen, pero también nunca olviden, nunca olviden que desde lo que hacemos podemos aportar al ambiente. Sigan adelante, siempre con perseverancia, con fuerza y constancia, pero obviamente aportemos al ambiente desde lo que hacemos. Gracias. I, I think thinking of generations ahead and taking those risks now is probably like that's what we've needed to be doing for a long time. And I do think that we have a history of people that have done that. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that there have been so many before us that have done these things that have laid the foundations for us to be where we are. Um, I come from a family of, of land protectors and uh, you know, my, my life story, I make jokes when people ask me, where did, how did I start get, in, get into this work? And I always say I was born into it and it, and I, it's, it's a joke, but it's real because the year that I was born, my family was forcibly removed from our territory via gunpoint from armed security of a company that um, illegally or shadily, uh, like through sort of some really coercive and intimidating means, got access to our lands and were wanting to exploit it for uranium 
development. And from that point on, I mean, even before that, my parents were living there to occupy the land to prevent the development of uranium ex exploration and development. And so my whole life has been about utilizing our knowledge systems, our rights. Uh, we come, I come from a matriarchal community where the women are the, the, the decider factors. Like we have a lot of men that have taken these roles of leadership at the front, but you talk to any man in our community, they say, I'm not actually the decision maker. It is my wife and the women in the community that make the decisions, but colonization propped these men up. And so I think about what does this mean for future generations? And I also have children. My children are older. My daughter is actually, she just turned 22 yesterday and my son is 10. And um, thinking about the, this world that we're leaving for these, my children, my daughter is studying education and with a, with a minor in indigenous studies and my son is just 10, so he's just 10, but uh, they are already aware of the imbalances, these, these imbalances, not just of the GHGs in the atmosphere or the, the pandemic, but of these the patriarchal colonial systems, white supremacy, and they have this in their purview. They understand it as they walk through the world, that this is part of the struggles that we have in addressing and restoring the imbalances that, that have come from the generations before them. And they also recognize the work that my parents did and my grandparents did, because my even my grandparents fought the Hudson Bay Company from over trapping and hunting in our territories. And we have this strong history of continually advocating for the lands. And my mom would never have called herself a feminist, but she is a feminist. And I don't think any of the women in my family would call themselves that, but they are feminists from an indigenous perspective and value system. And I have been studying in a part of a cohort of indigenous femini feminisms. And it's important that we include these in the future that we're thinking of, but that we root these things in where did we learn these values from? And these values come from the land. They come from the strength and the beauty of the river systems, of the animals, of the plants and the medicines and the, the teachings of the skies and the stars and the moon and the sun and the air and our ability to be in relationship with those, those elements is an import, just as critical as, and important as the cognitive ability to, to acknowledge and point out and structurally fight those systems? How do we simultaneously nurture our relationships with the land as we advocate for the dismantling of the structures that, that lent to those um, disconnections? And I think it's just as important that I take my son out to, to I know some people might not like, but catch frogs or see salamanders or, or go hunting or go fishing. Uh, pick medicines. It's just as important that I teach him that as much as I teach him about smashing the patriarchy and decolonization. And these are really, really critical components to the future that we're leaving for future generations. And that this isn't about power over. This isn't about power over men, power over, you know, colonial systems or structures. This is about rebalancing. And that is the most critical lesson that I teach my children all the time. We have to have balance. We have two, two ears and one mouth for a reason so that we can listen twice as much as we speak. And that means listening to the land and listening to our relations. Uh, this conversation in, of, in and of itself was really good medicine. I'm grateful for each of you. I'm grateful for your stories, your truths, your connectedness to the natural world and all the wisdom and the baskets of care, right? That you shape and bring to this work. The Nakwaka level and thank you for having this conversation with me. It's, it's been wonderful. <laughs> Global Just Recovery Gathering.